Okay, right now. Um, I welcome you to our second lecture series of the semester. I'm Francisca Soltner and I'm part of the organizational team. As always, uh, we all will have a short demographic survey um, in the beginning. You can take part in it now. And um, while the lecture, you can submit your questions via the F and A like tool and during the lecture, we collect them and um, please keep in mind that you will probably won't have time to get through all of the questions at the end. So please make use of the voting function and upload for the question you're most curious about. Uh, if there are no further questions about the organizational part of the lecture, um, I will now introduce you our guest, um, Professor John Sweeney from the Maynooth University Island. I hope the pronunciation was right. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Glasgow and has been a member of the Geography Department of Maynooth uh, University um, since 1978. He has served as a president for Irish Meteorological Society, the Geographical Society of Ireland and the National Trust of Ireland. He also has been the Irish representative on a number of European academic bodies. Professor Sweeney contributed also to the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. He's a regular contributor to print and broadcast media on matters related to climate change. And even um, he received an award for his achievement in journalism. So thank you for um, like taking your time, Mr. Spini, for being here and I hope you all enjoy the lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Francisca. And uh, thank you for inviting me to, to talk to you this afternoon. Um, I'm talking to you from a, a nice sunny Ireland, which is relatively unusual in this part of the world. Spring has come quite early this year, and that may itself, of course, be something to do with climate change as well. But uh, I, I'm very pleased to be talking to you, and um, I'm going to go through a lot of slides over the next hour or so. Um, I hope I don't go too quickly for you, but I think this is such an important topic that I really want to cover quite a lot of ground um, in it as well. Now, let me see if I can get to the next slide. Yes, I mean, <clears throat> I think we've all been looking at these kinds of graphs for the past year, maybe year and a half almost at this stage. <clears throat> and we've seen the way in which uh, COVID has ebbed and flowed over the course of the past year. Um, and at this stage in April, we know that uh, sadly, uh, about 3 million people have died across the world uh, from this pandemic. And I show it to you because um, if you think of that figure of 3 million, um, the World Health Organization who produced that data also have produced other data. And the other data I'm showing you here is what they expect to see in the period between 2030 and 2040 in terms of people who die indirectly and directly as a result of climate change. And you can see the expectation is that about a quarter of a million people per year will die extra <clears throat> as a result of things like malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, heat stress, which have strong connections, especially in the developing world, to the climate changes that are going to occur there. The rather strange map here uh, shows also that most of those people who, who die will be in places such as um, Africa, South Asia in particular, and that's where the bulk of people are going to feel the biggest stress from climate change. You'll notice how small Europe is up here and even parts of North America uh, by comparison. And right away it tells us that the main victims of this uh, problem of climate change are going to be people principally in the poorest parts of the world. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment or two because it raises issues of equity and it raises issues of justice. But I just wanted to start by, by telling us that yes, we are very pre, very concerned at the moment about COVID and about uh, the pandemic that we're facing. We may even be worried about what comes afterwards in terms of paying for all of the extra supports that our economies have needed 
over the past year. But let's not forget that in the background, the climate has continued to change and continues to pose problems in the years ahead. <clears throat> I wanted to show you, uh, to begin with here, uh, uh, two aerial photographs of a, a glacier. And this glacier is in Iceland. Um, it's called Jokal. And you can see what the photograph showed in 1986 of this glacier, a nice big healthy glacier around uh, an old volcano here. And by 2019, you can see it's virtually gone away. Um, it's only the, the, the remains of it in the volcanic, volcanic caldera that's left behind. And this uh, I'm showing to you because this is the first Icelandic glacier which was officially declassified, officially told, you're gone, you're history, you're dead. And um, I, I show it to you because if you think of something that has passed away, then you usually have a little ceremony to mark that, and maybe you put up a headstone uh, to, to mark it as well. And that's just what the people of Iceland did for their, um, for their glacier here a couple of years ago. And here's the Prime Minister of Iceland putting a little plaque um, on, the, on the stone next to where the glacier was. And the words, I think, uh, are very important for us. The words are very telling, I think, as well. Uh, and what the plaque says <coughs> is that uh, Oknajokal is the first Icelandic glacier to lose its status as a glacier. And in the next 200 years, all of our glaciers are expected to follow the same path. And this monument is to acknowledge, and here's the key thing, to acknowledge, one, that we know what is happening. Two, <clears throat> we know what needs to be done. <clears throat> That's very important. We know what's happening. We know what needs to be done. And then the third thing, which I think is, is equally important, only you know if we did it, a message for the people that come after us, a message for the next generation. Um, did we act? Did we do what was necessary uh, in 2021 or not? And that's the theme I'll come back to later on. <clears throat> now, you know, of course, the, the problem is, is, is very well known at this stage, the problem whereby the earth has been warming up. And this kind of a map is something you've probably seen a hundred times. It shows the warming from the middle of the 20th century uh, to the present day. And I show it to you uh, to make two points here. The first point is that you can see not everywhere on the globe warms up to the same extent. Uh, you can see, for example, that the interiors of the continents warm up more than the oceans. You can see also that the high latitudes, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, warm up more than the middle latitudes and the tropics and the equatorial regions. And why, why is that important? Well, it's important because we often use terms like global average, 1.5 degrees, two degrees of warming, uh, and that conceals a lot of geographical variations, a lot of variability from place to place. <clears throat> so that when we talk about 1.5 degrees of warming uh, on a global average, we may be talking about a lot, a lot more in individual places uh, and the impacts therefore are going to be uh, quite considerably different in individual places. We know also uh, that the, the other thing we know is that the, the warmth has become more marked, that last year um, we know was the warmest year on record since thermometers became reliable in the 19th century. Um, it was the joint warmest year ever on the planet, together with 2016, which is not that far back either. And we know that 19 of the 20 warmest years since we had thermometers that were reliable all have occurred since 2000, uh, all in the present century, therefore, in a short period of time. For us in Europe, last year was the warmest year in record, clearly. Now, many of you are under 30, many of you are students, and I can tell you that um, you've never experienced a month during your lifetime 
in which the average temperature of the Earth for any month um, during your life was below the average of the 20th century. So we're living in quite exceptional times. We're living in times where we have experienced uh, considerable unparalleled warmth, at least over the past few centuries. And we know also that the causes of those are, are what we're doing to the atmosphere. And you might ask the question, well, um, how do we know that things are different now in the atmosphere than they were in the past? How do we measure the carbon dioxide that we keep talking about in the atmosphere? And of course, you can measure that directly very easily uh, for the present day. And this is one of the, the most important global weather, not weather, but global monitoring stations for greenhouse gases. It's in the extreme west of Ireland, uh, close to the Atlantic Ocean, where the air is very clean uh, and not contaminated too much by, by industrial effluent. But that gives only a very short record. And we would like to know what was it like 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, by comparison. And that's more difficult to do. And there have been some very ingenious ways uh, thought up to try and find out what the, the atmosphere was like in the very distant past. One of them here was to, well, can we get a probe into uh, one of these pyramids where the burial chamber of the pharaohs has been sealed up for 5,000 years and airtight? And if we can sample the air, we maybe would be able to tell how much carbon dioxide was in the air then, 5,000 years ago. It wasn't very successful, I'm afraid to say, uh, and you can, uh, you can perhaps deduce why, uh, if you've got a body lying around for 5,000 years, it's going to contaminate the air quite a lot. So people gave up on this one, I think, fairly quickly. But what they didn't give up on was actually looking at uh, other records from longer, uh, periods of deposition, in particular ice. And here you can see uh, the front of a glacier in the Andes in this case. And if you look closely, you'll see the layers of ice. Each of those layers is an annual uh, accumulation of ice, where the, uh, the snow of the previous year has been buried and compacted by the snow of the next year, and so on and so on. They're rather like tree rings in some ways that you can count back from the top and you can work out the age of each of those layers. And if you get a, a layer, you can then extract the ice from it. And when you do that, you can see that it's often composed of little bubbles like this. And if you melt that little chunk of ice, you're actually sampling the air that was in existence when that layer of ice was laid down many thousands of years ago, perhaps. And we can go back now, <clears throat> something up to two and a half million, million years and find what the atmosphere composition was like at that time. And that's a very powerful way of figuring out where are we today in terms of what we're doing to the atmosphere. This is just a little demonstration of that. Um, each of these dots are places that the current temperature, current, sorry, atmospheric composition of CO2 was measured. And they go from the South Pole here on the left to the North Pole here on the right. The equator is in the middle. And each monitoring station is telling you what the carbon dioxide concentration was like in a particular year. And if we start in 1979, the average was about 336 parts per million at that time. But you can see how, as we move through time, the concentrations go up and they go up across the whole planet because carbon dioxide, once you emit it, mixes very freely throughout the whole atmosphere. <clears throat> you can see also this rather strange sawtooth effect where um, the average reflects an up and down seasonal cycle. And that seasonal cycle is because carbon dioxide, as well as going into the atmosphere, also gets taken out of the atmosphere by plants once they grow. And so we find that during winter time, when the leaves have fallen off the trees, 
we have higher carbon dioxide concentrations. And then in the summertime, the levels go down because the leaves are photosynthesizing and taking the carbon dioxide back out. And you'll notice there's a difference here between the two sides of the graph. This side is much more volatile, the northern hemisphere, and the, the southern hemisphere is much more stable. And that's because the seasonal cycle is much more marked in the northern hemisphere, where of course there's lots of land, and lots of land means lots of trees and lots of vegetation, whereas the southern hemisphere, well, it's mostly ocean. So we have this difference, but overall you can see we've now got up to well over 400 parts per million. Now we can push that record back further. We have a lot less stations to do it. Uh, we can use, for example, tree rings and use other methods of looking at carbon dioxide. And what we find is it settles down uh, around about the time of the industrial revolution, it settles down at a level of about 278 parts per million, a lot lower than our 417 that we have today. And even when we push that record way back through the various ice ages, um, way back through glacials and interglacials, we find that it never really gets up to anything like that pre-industrial level. Yes, we do get slight fluctuations during previous interglacials uh, and glacials, but it's always much, much lower than we have today. So we've transformed effectively at the atmosphere from, if you like, the status that it had for perhaps the past 800,000 years. And it's not surprising, therefore, that things are happening to our climate as a consequence. Oh, I've got this horrible window and I can't move it. <laughs> Let me go back one. Um, we can't see what we've done to the atmosphere. We can't see carbon dioxide. If we could trap it in a balloon, this is what a ton would look like. It would look uh, like this big orange balloon here. And last year in Germany, um, Germany produced 739 million of those balloons, 739 million tons of carbon dioxide uh, was produced. That's about, um, I suppose, nine tons for every person listening to this talk this afternoon. And that's what we are responsible for as individuals. Germany has the highest total emissions in the EU. It's been falling. Germany has been doing quite well by comparison to other countries, but it still has about a fifth of all the emissions in the EU uh, and about double the emissions of its next uh, nearest neighbor, France, for example. So uh, that's where we're, we're at. And this other graph now, there's another strange map, shows where are those emissions coming from? And what you can see here is that, <clears throat> again, uh, the, the southern continents here are very small. The developing countries really don't figure very strongly on this map, whereas the big industrial countries, this is where most of the emissions are coming from. The United States, uh, Western Europe, uh, the big developing countries of India and China, South Korea and Japan. So we have right away this uh, rather strange geographical difference in that the people who are causing the problem are, are us up here in the developed world, but the people who are bearing the brunt, as we saw earlier, are mainly in the poorer countries of the world. As I say, Germany is, is in the top 10 greenhouse gas emitting countries globally. Um, and those top 10%, those top 10 countries produce about two thirds of the total global greenhouse gas emissions. So we have a very marked uh, discontinuity in terms of who causes the problem and who suffers from the problem. Then I'll come back to uh, later on. The second thing then is that, well, we can now project um, what's going to happen if we continue along that current path. And this is from the Intergovernmental Panel's last assessment report. The next one is due out this year. They only come out every six or seven years. And what they are projecting is that the world will rise by, the temperature will rise by a further half a degree or so over the next 20 years. Um, and that Currently, we're on a very unsustainable trajectory, 
of possibly warming the planet by an average of four degrees uh, by the end of this century. And that's quite worrying because if you go back to the very first map, four degrees as a global average may well reflect much greater temperature rises over the land masses where people live. And of course, that will also reflect itself in terms of heat wave problems, in terms of, of extremes of temperature. In terms of rainfall, uh, we're not very sure what's going to happen because rainfall is much more variable. You'll know it can be raining uh, in your university uh, precinct today. And when you go home to your apartment, it can be dry. Uh, it's much more difficult to model rainfall. But what we can say is that it's most likely that the places that get too little rainfall will get less. And the places that get too much rainfall or snow will get more. And, and that's something that we have to build into managing the environment. But right away, it tells us that there's going to be vulnerable societies and vulnerable places around the world. And I wanted to show you three categories which I think would be of most concern. And the first one, of course, is, is one you probably have suspected. Uh, you'll, you'll be uh, aware that in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, for example, uh, the rain is crucial for life, crucial for society to eke out a living in those marginal places. They are so dependent on a small amount of rainfall, and if it fails, then they're in big trouble. And we've seen on our television screens the kind of problems that that actually causes um, to societies and the social fabric of societies begins to disentangle very quickly. The other zone of concern, of course, <coughs> is where people live very close to sea level. Maybe they live within a few meters of sea level and as sea level rises, uh, they're going to be very vulnerable indeed in places like the, the coral atolls, the coral islands of the world, um, where many hundreds of thousands of people live within a matter of a few metres of existing sea level. And this is again an issue uh, of climate justice, of course, because we are effectively saying to those people, well, your homeland is going to go. Your homeland may well be submerged. Your culture may well have to be distributed around other places. Uh, and that's an issue that, of course, raises a moral and raises an ethical issue with us as well in terms of, of whether we uh, in the developed world to maintain our standard of living <coughs> should continue and should be uh, acquiescing in the destruction of other countries' homelands. And the third area of concern <coughs> are the, the great deltas of the world, the great uh, deltaic regions. This is the Nile Delta you're looking down at from a satellite, uh, and you can see the uh, you can see the, the Nile Delta here. Here's the Nile going off towards the south, or to the right of our screen here, uh, the fertile zone from which a lot of civilization evolved. Now, in those regions, of course, civilization did evolve because the river brought down very valuable alluvium and very valuable sediment. <clears throat> and once the river reached the sea, of course, it stopped and dumped all of that uh, alluvium in a delta. Now, over time, that delta builds up higher and higher, and it becomes so heavy that it depresses the crust of the earth. So we find in many of these delta regions that there is subsidence taking place. The land is going down. And as the land is going down, the sea level, of course, is still rising. So we get, uh, if you like, a a telescoping of impacts in a very short period of time by comparison to many other parts of the world. This is very clear in the great deltas of Asia, in um, the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta here in Bangladesh. And the colours show how much of that land is only three or four metres above sea level. <clears throat> I show you this one because I wanted to put my own country, Ireland, on for scale. And to tell you, well, this is a country, Bangladesh, which is maybe twice or even maybe three times the size of Ireland at the most. But there's a big difference. And the big difference is on this island, 
that I live on, there's 6 million people. In Bangladesh, there's 160 million people. And you ask the question, well, where will these people go when sea level begins to rise? How many climate refugees will we create uh, in, in such areas in the future? Uh, because even a one meter rise in sea level, you can see, will lose about a quarter of their country. Um, and that's, that's why this is a problem that we really can't run away from. It's a problem of, of equity. It's a problem of, of climate justice. But let's go back to the science. And as I said already, um, <clears throat> the, the evidence is fairly incontrovertible that we have experienced a, a warming. Uh, and we're currently, well, we're about one degree above our pre-industrial level maybe 1.1 degree above our pre-industrial level. We're already seeing some of the impacts of that. Um, we've seen, for example, in the past year, you'll have been watching your television screens and seen the, the fires in Australia, the fires in uh, California, uh, the burning of tropical rainforest in places like the Amazon and the Congo Basin. And that, of course, is adding further to our greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Uh, it's estimated that, that those fires, for example, the burning especially of the Amazon, has added um, enough emissions to equate to the total emissions from a very large country like India, and almost at the moment not far short of the uh, emissions from the whole EU. So uh, there are a lot of things have been happening in the past year that we haven't really been aware of as we've been so focused on our own uh, pandemic. This is some work that um, I wanted to show you because it, it illustrates what the future holds for some of the most vulnerable places in terms of heat in the world uh, to, in the future. And all I need to show you here is this map here, which is if you look at the purple and the blue um, for the Arabian Peninsula here, what it's telling us is that if we continue um, on our present uh, emissions trajectory, this is sometimes called RCP 8.5, if we continue on that, then we're going to be facing mean average temperatures. That's mean average temperatures. Uh, maximum average, mean maximum average temperatures for that zone of over 55 degrees centigrade, um, you know, in, in terms of the, of the future. Now, if you think of what 55 degrees centigrade means, well, you're not going to go out very much in it. You're not going to be able to work in it. You're not even going to be able to adapt your society very well to it without a huge consumption of energy. So some parts of the world are going to find it very hard to adapt to the future. But the chief concern I think that many of us have in the climate science community is the possibility of what we call tipping points being reached. And here I'm indebted to some work done by a very well-known German climate scientist, Johannes Schnellhuber, uh, and also Stephen Ramsdorf and Winkleman, um, who looked at the what we call the Paris range, the 1.5 to 2 degree of warming range, and said, well, at that level, we begin to see things happening which may not be recoverable, things which may be starting to occur, which even if we become very good, may not be capable of being restored. And we're already seeing that, I think, with the coral islands, the coral reefs especially. Uh, we're also beginning to see the alpine glaciers go. And from Bavaria, you'll be very familiar with the, the way in which they are retreating. Uh, we're beginning to see the Arctic summer sea ice disappear um, as well. And even perhaps the beginning of the melt out of Greenland. Now, Greenland will take centuries to melt out, but it may not be capable of recovery uh, once that has started as a procedure. And further down the, the, the line, if we get to that four degree value, then we see a whole host of other potential tipping points, which are even more severe. Things like the oceanic circulation, loss of the Amazon, uh, the uh, southern oscillation becoming more uh, extreme and more frequent. And these are things we want to particularly see destabilizing our world. I want to say a few words about what's been happening in the past year because um, <coughs> there have been quite 
interesting advances in climate science. And the first one relates to uh, the awareness of the warmer Arctic that we mentioned at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> if you were in Germany last September, when the Arctic sea ice reached its minimum, well, you could have saved, sailed quite happily uh, from Hamburg, for example, all the way around the north coast of Siberia, all the way to Japan and to China, and you would not see any sea ice whatsoever. You could also be quite adventurous and go through the famous Northwest Passage to the west coast of North America, to California, to the southern coast of Alaska. Uh, again, uh, something our, parent, our grandparents would not have dreamed possible. And that's because our Arctic sea ice has been dwindling. Um, the blue line here shows where we are today, and you can see it's well below the average. It's well below at this stage even, and in April 2021, it's well below what was the worst Arctic sea ice season of 2012. So we're facing into probably um, a, a, an extreme low uh, sea ice uh, situation in the future. Now, why is that important? Well, one of the things that have been researched quite a lot this year has been the impact of warming the Arctic more than warming the equator, the thing we mentioned at the very beginning. And what we now believe may be possible is that that gradient between the equator and the poles is what drives our westerly circulation, is what drives the jet streams. And the stronger that gradient is, the stronger the jet stream is, the stronger our storms whistle around the earth very quickly. But once you get the, the polar areas warming up, then the gradient is reduced and you get the jet stream rather like a river with no gradient. You get the jet stream wandering and wobbling and creating perhaps more extremes such that you get more heat waves, or maybe you get even more cold waves, uh, depending on which limb you're under. And we've seen that uh, over the past few years. We had, for example, in 2018, a very warm winter in North America. And you may remember the very cold winter we had in Europe. And you can imagine the jet stream going through this big loop over North America and Europe. Whereas in 2019, we had the opposite. We had very cold weather in North America and very warm weather in Europe, very warm spring in Europe. Um, so there's some evidence that we're getting more in the way of those extremes. Second thing that's been discovered this year, perhaps, is that we've found the, the answer to a question which really used to annoy climatologists for many years, because every time there was an extreme event. Somebody in the media, somebody in the television or radio would phone up and say, is this caused by climate change? And the answer that I had to give and the answer that climatologists all had to give was, we can't say for certain that it was caused by climate change. It would be the kind of thing that we would expect to occur more frequently, but we can't attribute an individual event to climate change. Now, that argument is gone, and it's gone because we can now do something that gives us the answer to that. And that something is we can now use very powerful computer techniques, and we can run our computer models, not once, not twice, but maybe a thousand times. And of those thousand times, <clears throat> we can run them maybe 500 times with pre-industrial carbon dioxide levels, and 500 times with 2021 carbon dioxide levels. And we can say to the computer, how often will you get a heat wave in Germany of the type that you had in 2019 here um, with uh, pre-industrial levels of carbon dioxide as opposed to the current level? And you get an answer in terms of probability. And the answer would be in this case where you had that uh, extreme uh, temperature uh, in 2019 over much of Germany and France in the summertime, well, it was at least 10 times more likely as a consequence of climate change influence, as a consequence of carbon dioxide loading. And that is very powerful to give to policymakers as an answer to their question, because there's no way out of not doing something about it. 
if you can be positive about that. I wanted to show you this little example here as well, because um, uh, I taught for many years uh, climate, and I used to show two extreme kinds of climate. One was what I would call Irish climate, which was dominated by the ocean, where the winter and summer temperatures were very close together, uh, where we didn't get much frost in the winter, but we didn't get much heat in the summer. And the other extreme, of course, was what we call the continental climate, which was a long way away from the ocean, where we got very cold winters and very warm summers. And the classic place for that was in northern Siberia in Verha, a place called Verhoyansk. It's a small town, maybe uh, 1,300 people. It's the um, reputedly the coldest inhabit, permanently inhabited place on the planet. And normally in winter, they get temperatures away down to, <coughs> to the minus 40s, even touching minus 50 degrees centigrade. Can you imagine that? Minus 50s. You've had some cold in Bavaria, but maybe not quite that bad. <clears throat> but then in the summer, it goes up maybe to maybe 20 at the most, but normally about 15 or 16 degrees. And there's a huge difference, as you can see, between winter and summer. Well, this summer in Siberia, the temperature went up to 38 degrees centigrade. Uh, and that was so exceptional for this part of the world, which is not that far, well inside the Arctic Circle, not that far from the North Pole. And again, you could use your attribution uh, to work out how probable was that compared to what would have occurred without carbon dioxide at the level that we have today in the atmosphere. And what it comes up as, well, 600 times more likely. Okay, well, you're getting evidence now that really destroys the myth of climate skepticism. And that's very important for policymakers. So this lady taking her milk home, for example, in the winter, is now experiencing something that's 600 times more likely as a consequence of climate change, which she has not contributed very much to, I should add. What has happened though, of course, uh, as a result of all of this has been the Arctic has opened up. And you can sail, as I said, all the way around the Arctic. And there was about 400 voyages in August alone this year from Western Europe to Japan and China through the Northern Sea Route here. It was so warm, in fact, in, in Siberia this last summer that the sea ice that normally forms by, by September, the end of September, over the Laptev Sea here and off the coast of northern Siberia, you can see it didn't form at all. It remained open all the way through to early November, an unheard of event in that part of the world. So strange things are happening. And the last point I want to make, and I'll make it quickly, is we now know with a lot more certainty what the end product of doubling carbon dioxide will be in terms of temperature rise. Uh, and that's uh, been the holy grail for climatologists for decades now, because it's the calibration you use for your global climate model. You tell your global climate model, if carbon dioxide doubles, this will be the kind of response in temperature globally. And for most of the past 30 years, 40 years, that range was about 1.5 to 4.5 degrees centigrade of warming. But we now know that it's going to be much narrower. And that's really good news. It gives us a lot more certainty about our climate models for the future. And again, uh, all of these, each one of these is a paper, is a study uh, of what the anticipated climate sensitivity, as we call it, would be. And most of them fall in that gray area of 1.5 to 4 degrees. But there are a few who still argue that the climate warming will only be one degree. These are mostly where the skeptics and the climate contrarian stuff lies. But now again, we're finding that those are not going to be really uh, valid in the future. Now, of course, there are some parts of the world where those that warming and those changes will not be welcome in the natural world. And I'm showing you some examples here from Ireland, where we know we have a lot of bogs that will not like drying out in the summer. We know our salt marshes will not like uh, rises in sea level. 
Uh, we have valuable coastal habitats like Machair, which again will not like rises in sea level. And just as in Bavaria, the mountains are going to be very important in terms of what happens there because as the mountains warm up and plant species move uphill, they can last for a while. Uh, but what happens when they get to the top of the mountain? Uh, that, that's when the problems really uh, come in. And there are species that are going to not like that warmth. Species that maybe like cold water, um, even species like salmon, in which we have a lot of economic dependence uh, in Western Europe, uh, are going to find it difficult. And we're already seeing some species beginning to become extinct, unfortunately. Partly climate, but also contributed to by habitat reduction, by uh, intensive agriculture and so on. I wanted to show you this um, particularly interesting um, little moth for a moment. Um, it's, it's one of the species that um, looks very nice when you show a photograph of it, but its real trick is it destroys chestnut trees. And uh, it's called the chestnut leaf miner. And I show you it because uh, it takes away the leaves of the trees very quickly and you can't eradicate it once it becomes established because it overwinters in the leaves that fall on the ground in the autumn. And I show you it because it was first found away down here in the Republic of Macedonia in 1981. And since then it's made its way north as the climate has warmed and it's made its way through Germany and uh, it's even made its way across the English Channel through England, and it's arriving even in Ireland now. But I wanted to show you it because at the moment, your chestnut leaves are coming out. So have a look over the next few weeks and see what's happening to them, because this is what the chestnut leaf miner does when it mines into the leaf. It leaves the leaves destroyed like this. So have a look at your chestnut trees, maybe in June and July, and see if you're finding this invasive species uh, coming through as well. But really, I, I said I would talk about Paris and so on, and I want to talk a bit more about Paris now, because um, I had the privilege of being both in Paris and Copenhagen in 2009, and also in many of the COPs in between and since. And um, I wanted to say that we can't understand Paris without understanding a little of what went before it. And the most important event before it was the Copenhagen Conference of 2009, because this was going to be the conference that solved the climate change problem. And everybody who was anybody went to that conference. Um, it was a huge gathering. Uh, you can see a very young Angela Merkel here, uh, quite a young Barack Obama here, even Hillary Clinton, uh, Sarkozy, Prince Charles. Uh, they, all, they all were there in a huge conference that was going to be the be all and end all of the climate change problem. But it didn't work out like that. Uh, first of all, the conference was badly organized and many of the people who should have got in didn't get in, especially young people who all turned up expressing their uh, anger at the way in which the climate problem was being handled. Um, uh, so people queued for well, I, I was at the back of the queue here for eight hours that day. Uh, eventually, I did manage to get in, but it was a very um, emotional conference. And really, what was emotional about it was the fact that the, the real decision came down to these two men. Uh, I recall going on the train to the conference centre um, in Copenhagen, and the train didn't move. And for, uh, for many minutes, it didn't move. And I asked the guard finally, what's happening? And he said, well, the bridges to Stockholm have been closed. All the trains have been stopped. The traffic has been stopped. Nothing will move until Air Force One lands. Everybody was waiting for Barack Obama to come because the conference was deadlocked. And this was the last day of the conference coming up last couple of days actually. And it was seen uh, as a, a deadlock conference between the Chinese position and the United States position. And Obama, to his credit, decided he would try and break the deadlock. And what he did was he went and he knocked on the door of the Chinese delegation. 
and he said, I'd like to talk to Mr. Uh, to, the, to Premier Wenji Bao. And a very junior official came and said, sorry, he's not ready. Can you wait over there? And that's not the kind of thing you say to the president of the United States. So there was elements of political, um, if you like, power plays going on. And Obama waited for a while and then he barged into the room. And when he got into the room, he found this scene here where the president of Brazil, of India, uh, of China, of South Africa were all hatching their own agreement for the Copenhagen conference. Uh, and that was, uh, if you like, not the thing to do in a United Nations conference. Uh, so the conference failed. It failed miserably and it left a lot of bad taste in the mouths of people. Um, it didn't actually officially adopt the Copenhagen Accord at the end of the day. Uh, it was more a declaration. And because of that, when it came well, the failure was quite complete. It, it, all the plans were gone, but there was a new world order had emerged, which was really looking at national uh, and rather than global priorities. Multilateralism had died. And in Europe, which had previously held, if you like, the candle alight in climate change during the Bush years, um, they were not at that table. They were not any more leaders in the issue of climate change. And really, of course, the, the deniers and the skeptics, as you can imagine, had a field day. So roll on to coming up to Paris, the damage limitation exercise took about five years before people were ready to go again. And a lot of the credit for that comes um, to, to uh, Ban Ki-moon here, who tirelessly worked for those four or five years to bring people back together. And in the lead up to Paris, we had a lot of choreography to make sure that it wouldn't fail once again. So the United Nations worked very hard. Uh, President Obama and President Xi had a preparatory meeting at which they agreed to have a, a restriction on emissions uh, plan agreed with, between themselves. Of course, President Bush sabotaged that in later years, but that was important at the time. Pope Francis issued his famous encyclical, uh, Laudato Si, which was very well received in the, in the developing world in particular, and explained the climate crisis, not in theological terms, but in very plain language, uh, which emphasized the ethical and the climate justice angle. And the French diplomatic system under President Hollande worked hard as well. So an agreement did emerge. And that agreement was an agreement which we thought at the time was really the solution to the problem. Um, instead of laying down the law from above, countries were told, well, what can you pledge at your level to do? And those countries came back with pledges, which we called uh, nationally determined contributions or NDCs. But the overall objective was to add them all up and make sure that, that some of them uh, held the temperature rise of the world to well below two degrees centigrade and to even pursue efforts to keep it below 1.5 degrees centigrade. And that seemed to be a really euphoric historic moment. I was there and I can, I can tell you the atmosphere was electric, people were emotional, people who had worked on the climate change issue were crying uh, when that uh, communique came out and the agreement was reached. But since then, things have not gone well. And they've not gone well because, well, countries have not held to their pledges properly. And indeed, the pledges themselves have been, if you like, conditional. And I'm showing you three here just to illustrate that. I could show you any number of them, but here's Jordan's um, pledge. And what it's saying is Jordan will reduce its emissions by 14% by 2030. However, if it doesn't get the international financial aid it wants, then it will only reduce it by 1.5%. So here you have an economic condition introduced into the pledge. If you take the state of Palestine nearby, um, Yes, they're going to reduce their emissions by 24.4% by 2040. 
Um, but unless, they would argue, unless the occupation of Palestine finishes, it's only going to be 12.8. So here's a political condition introduced. And finally, Israel itself, we're going to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, by 26% uh, on a per capita basis per capita basis. Now there's another statistical condition, per capita basis, well, what happens if your population doubles as is vastly increasing in Israel at the moment, then the actual amount of emissions goes up, even if you do reduce it somewhat on a per capita basis. So here you have a statistical condition. And all of that really means that countries have not delivered on their pledges. They've not delivered in that, and they've been encouraged, as we know, by the, the exit of the United States from the Paris Agreement um, subsequently. And that has continued uh, even after Paris. Um, one of the interesting things that happened in Paris was the United Nations Framework Convention um, people said, well, look, tell us what's going to happen with 1.5 degrees of warming. Uh, give us a report, a scientific report. And the IPCC went off to do that. They weren't really encouraged to do that by some countries who didn't want to know. And then when it became evident what the report was, there was attempts to block the acceptance of it uh, at the IPCC plenary itself uh, until the last minute. And then when it came to COP24 in Katowice a few years back, um, the normal procedure of welcoming the UNFCC, or sorry, welcoming the IPCC report was blocked by uh, the United States, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Russia. And because the United Nations only works on a unanimity basis, they could not be welcomed uh, as such. So you see the kind of politics at play. And the bottom line, of course, was that, well, we know from that report that we have to reduce our emissions by around 45% relative to the 2010 values um, if we're to avoid 1.5 degrees of warming. Notice 2010 is somewhere up here. Yeah, we've lost 10 years of that already. So you can see the way the clock is ticking and the figure now, uh, for example, that the EU is working on is a 55% reduction by 2030. But the bottom line is very considerable cuts are required in a very short period of time. And that's why this, I think, is quite a scary diagram because it says, okay, if you want to avoid 1.5 degrees of warming and you want to give yourself a 50-50 chance, you have to start working now because at current levels, you, you're only going to have about nine years left to burn. If you want to avoid two degrees and give yourself a 50-50 chance, you've only got less than three decades to burn. And as, I, as you say already, as I said already, we've lost a number of those years. And that means that because carbon dioxide lasts in the atmosphere for hundreds of years, we're talking about forever budgets here. We're talking about the next generation and the generation afterwards. And we're talking therefore about not having the luxury of procrastinating and waiting uh, around for things to improve. And that was quite clear at the COP in Chile, um, except that despite all of that, there was no progress made. Even after five years, the rules from Paris have still not been agreed. There's been a lot of um, negotiating going on by countries who simply don't want to achieve them. Uh, who look after their own self-interest first and foremost. Um, and for example, you know, they want to have concessions for credits that they've built up during the, the bad years of economic recession, which they have stored in the bank and which uh, would allow them to get away with not doing anything significant for the next 10 years. Uh, and there are countries that want to get um, credits for not burning their forests down and then credits for holding on to, 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 to wood and so on. The, the rule book has simply not been finalised. And the question, of course, is, well, what will happen now in Glasgow for COP26? Will we agree a more ambitious set of pledges 
especially between China and the United States? Will the rule book be sorted out regarding the trading of carbon? Will, and this is the key one, will the developed countries agree to the, meeting their commitments to financing uh, a just transition for the developing countries to enable them not to make the mistakes that we in the developed world have made uh, through our industrial processes. And that's going to be 100 billion a year. It sounds like a lot, but it's actually very, very small uh, compared when you, when you add it up over the whole of the developed world. And of course, the big question is now, will the COVID recovery be a green recovery? Uh, will, will we ease the debt burden in the developing countries or not? And the biggest lender to the developing countries at the moment is China. So we have this political interaction um, which is going to be crucial. And that's why, if you like, uh, the current climate summit that you're reading about in North America with President Biden, uh, which President Xi in China is attending um, online, which the, um, the rest of the global community is attending online is so important. John Kerry, the climate envoy, has just come back from Beijing. And I know from seeing him in action over the various COPs, he has very good relations with the Chinese negotiators, with his counterparts. And the big question you have to look at for the next 48 hours is, Will China make a pledge to maybe bring forward its decarbonization target? Will the United States go for a 50% reduction by 2030? Um, will it have, if you like, the, the ability to reverse the bad years of President Trump uh, in terms of the promises it's going to make? And here's something that's just hot of the press today, because last night, You'll be pleased to know, or maybe you won't, you'll be pleased to know that Europe has finally agreed on a climate law set of rules as well. They negotiated all through the night until five o'clock in the morning today, and we now have a European climate law which is uh, targeting a 55% reduction by 2030. Uh, it's going to be monitored by a, an advisory board. Uh, it's going to be uh, progressed in 2040, uh, good budget terms uh, in, in the next three years as well. The sad bits about it, well, we still haven't managed to bring international shipping and aviation into the net, um, and that's sad. But we have, a, again, the climate neutrality objective for Europe as a whole, but not for individual member states. So here are the the battleground zones where countries act like individuals and look after their own self-interest. And it's not an easy thing to get a, 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 an agreement at a, at, a, at a big level like that. Now, there's one, some good news, uh, and I'm nearly finished, you'll be glad to hear. There's some good news happening. And one of the good things that has been happening has been many parts of the world have been divesting away their, their investments from uh, from fossil fuel based investments. And it started in the universities. It started in Vermont, um, where Bill McKibben in 2010 had a number of postgrad students sitting around the table asking them, well, what will we do? And he said to them, well, you take Europe, you take Asia, you take South America, go and get them to take their money out of fossil fuel investments. And so universities started divesting. Uh, the first was Stanford, Georgetown, my own alma mater, Glasgow, uh, my current um, university, Maynooth, where, where was the first in Ireland to do it. Uh, and we now began to see that the foundations were beginning to divest as well. The sovereign wealth funds of nations were beginning to divest as well. The faith groups, the churches were beginning to divest, the pension funds, the people who had money in unit trusts, and all of that began to grow enormously over the past few years. So there's a very large movement now out of uh, fossil fuel based investments. Uh, the first country in the world to divest its sovereign wealth fund from fossil fuels, I'm pleased to say, was my own. Um, and uh, th that's, that was something that was achieved with a struggle, but it's something that I think will be happening in other countries as well. And when you see people like the Rockefellers divesting, you know what they made their money on? Oil. 
you know that the writing is on the wall in many respects. And of course, the movement of, of uh, people has been, if you like, galvanized by the activities of the young people, of people like Greta here, who have captured the imagination of young people all over the world, and who have introduced the important concept of intergenerational equity, that really we're fighting for something for the next generation. And we have no right as as old timers like myself, to use up the resources, to mortgage the resources of the present at the expense of the next generation to come along. So we've seen these kinds of protests, and I'm sure you have them in Germany as well, the school strikers, the young people, and they have got the ear uh, of the politicians at last. And politicians are now sitting up listening to what these people are doing. And at the end of the day, Let's remember, let's look at this lady and ask, well, what is she saying to us here? Uh, is she saying, I'm a fiercely independent woman, I can carry my firewood and my baby, I just need a little help. I just need you not to make my burden heavier. But it's important, I think, that we recognize that our actions in the developed world have direct impacts on people like that in the developing world as well. And finally, uh, just to show you my last slide here, and that is something that the IPCC very seldom do because the IPCC is a very conservative organization. They don't make radical statements. And for them to come out with this kind of statement is, is really out of character for them. And it's, it's very true. Every action matters. Every bit of warming matters. Every year matters and every choice matters. And I think that kind of sums up the importance of tackling this problem now and tackling it effectively. And let's hope that with the understanding of the science, with the understanding of the politics, we can actually drive uh, an end to what will be the most serious problem of the 21st century. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for this interesting lecture and taking your time for being here. Um, yeah, I already saw some questions and I will ask you the most uploaded one now. Um, so uh, we talked a lot about problems. What do you think are the most important solutions? Yes, um, you're right. Uh, the, the solutions are vital here. I think there's no magic bullet, there's no silver bullet, there's no one solution. Really, it's such a big problem, we have to tackle it on many fronts. And I would suggest that the first thing we have to do is we have to become more efficient in how we use energy. Um, we're very inefficient in, in terms of uh, misusing energy um, by and large. For example, you know, we leave lights on. Uh, we drive more than we should when we could walk or cycle. Uh, we heat our homes often rather more than we need to. We buy appliances which are often energy inefficient rather than the ones which may cost a little more in the short term but will save us money in the long term. We have to change a little our diet away from meat if we can as well, which is very inefficient in terms of its greenhouse gas per calorie produced. Um, and that's a big controversy, as you can imagine, in places like Ireland here, where we have a very strong agricultural lobby. Um, and we have to do all of those things, but we also have to have leadership from our politicians. We have to have laws which encourage us to do the right thing. And that's what we've been lacking in the past. We've been lacking the ability for, if you like, a top-down approach, which enables us to change our ways, to change our culture, to change the way we operate. And I think we need all of those things and that if we're to make a, a, a stab at this problem as well. Yeah, um, next question, it's very close to the other one. Uh, do you think climate neutrality can be achieved with our, our current Western standard of living? That's a very interesting question and, you know, there's a lot of controversy as to what we mean by climate neutrality. And I worry a little that sometimes people that talk about 
climate neutral. Um, they don't define at what level emissions will be that are going to be cancelled out by credits and by forests and so on. Um, it's, it's true that even if we get to what we term climate neutrality by 2050, we will still have emissions, we will still have cattle grazing, we will still have methane being emitted. And I think we can, um, we, we can actually tackle that, we can, we can counteract that. I think what we've seen in the past few years has been firstly a huge fall in renewable energy costs. Um, renewable energy is now really competitive with the traditional fossil fuel based energy systems. We also know that we expect hydrogen to be and ammonia to be capable of being used in mobile transport systems. We expect them to be able to be used, for example, in trains um, and in big trucks and perhaps even in planes. That will be the most difficult of all. But I think, you know, with the will in, that we might, with, with the reality, I suppose, that we have no choice but to go to climate zero, climate neutral, um, I think we can change direction sufficiently to get there, but I don't know if we can do it by 2050. I think we will still have problems uh, even in 30 years time when many of you are reaching my grand old age, you will still be fighting the same fight, but hopefully you'll be fighting it from a level at which uh, a, a lot of the most severe impacts that would otherwise have occurred will at least have been overcome. So. I, I'm not. I'm not particularly optimistic, but I think uh, we have no very lit, little choice but to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And I think the next question is referring to the tipping points. Um, mm. um, if we started right now to do everything we can to lower our CO2 emissions, would we be able to reverse everything, or is it already too late? Because I always get the feeling it's kind of a fight against the losing battle, and I feel very hopeless. Well, you shouldn't feel hopeless. It's never too late to do the right thing. It's never too late to make a start on the problem. And it's never too late to at least feel that you, are, by taking action, you're staving off the worst effects of all. Now, it is true that we will probably lose the coral reefs. It's true that sea level will continue to rise no matter what we do at this stage. And the expectation is that sea level will rise by something around a metre in the current century, something around three metres in the next century, and then a thing up to 15 metres in the 22nd and 23rd centuries. So those kind of things will go on. Uh, what we have to do is adapt as best we can to them. But I think, you know, we can't give up. We can't say, because I'm only a small contributor, um, it's not worth my while trying. I get this argument um, thrown at me by climate skeptics all the time, and they say to me, oh, China is building X number of coal burning power stations every month. Um, what's the point in us trying to do anything in Europe? But in reality, it's a, pe it's a question of moral responsibility. And you might say to yourself, well, um, what's the point in me not throwing my litter on the ground in my university? Because everybody else is doing it and everybody's cumulative litter makes mine seem very small indeed. And that's the kind of argument that you get, which forces people to be despondent and forces people to be a, a bit, I suppose, despairing about the future, but we can't do that. We have a responsibility to those that come after us. We have a responsibility to the next generation. Uh, and you have to ask yourself, well, what kind of legacy do I want to pass on to my children, to my grandchildren? Um, what questions will they ask me in 30 years time? Will they say, uh, mother, why didn't you act in 2021? Uh, when you knew the scale of the problem? Why didn't you do something about it? Or will they say instead, weren't you great? Weren't you great that you actually noticed what was going wrong? And although you only made a small contribution, you did it for the right reasons and you moved things, however small, in the right direction. 
and that's the kind of philosophy I would have ab about that. Um, you know, I think people will begin to take climate change seriously uh, as the years go on, when they begin to realise um, the scale of the problem. And you know, it's been quite interesting in the last year. You know, you you've sat in the house looking out the window, and you've seen the seasons change. You've seen the birds, you've seen the wildlife, you've seen the leaves and the trees and so on. And many people have got a new awareness of the links between our everyday life and the natural world. And I'm hoping that that kind of awareness continues um, after we've got over the present problems. And I think it will. I think people's attitudes have changed. And that's something that's very positive, I think, for the future. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> uh, how possible is that development developed nations have the help the underdeveloped and developed nations financially so that they start to reduce CO2 emissions? Will the rich nations let go of their economic dominance? Do you think people won't take climate change serious until it became become a global issue like COVID has become at the present? Well, as I said, this is the key question for the, the COP coming up in Glasgow. Um, uh, many years ago, a fund was established called the Green Climate Fund. And the intention was that the developed nations would subscribe to this fund um, to build it up to $100 billion per year. And some developed nations have done really well. Uh, Denmark, for example, has given, I think, about $60 per capita to it. Um, uh, I'm not sure what the German total is, but it's, it's roughly the same, I suspect. Uh, the Scandinavian nations have given a lot of money to it, but there are other countries that have not. And I think what we have to recognize here is that by encouraging developing countries to develop sustainably, we're also creating at the same time markets for our own industrial products. And I know in Germany, there's a great deal of debate about, about the, the auto industry. Um, you know, wouldn't it be great if electric cars were being sold to India in huge numbers uh, in, in 20 years time, for example, as a result of India making a sustainable transition um, to, to, to a more uh, energy, energy efficient society and decarbonized society. So I think it, ultimately it's in the interests of the developed world to it's not just conscience money, although it's partly conscience money because we've caused the problem, but it's in the interests of the developed world to encourage a sustainable transition in the developing countries for that reason. And also, let's go back to our climate refugees problem as well. Um, if we're going to create billions of climate refugees in the developing world, where are they going to go? They're going to come to the developed world, and that's going to be uh, an economic burden for the developed world as well. So it's important that I think we foster uh, sustainable development for, for various reasons in the developing countries of the world uh, as best we can. The next question is, um, how can I as a single person make the biggest impact? Well, I think as a single person, um, you probably maybe don't own your own house. That, that's a problem because it's difficult then to start insulating your house properly. But you know that may come in time when you, when you uh, graduate or when you move on. As a single person, you have a lot more choice over, for example, your transport system. Uh, can you walk to, to college? Can you walk to work? Can you cycle to work um, uh, rather than drive uh, in the future? And as a single person, you have a purchasing power. Now, when you go out to buy a new kettle or when you go out to buy a new microwave, you'll notice inside the label of that, there is this lovely rainbow of energy efficiency, red, green, yellow, uh, and the energy efficiencies are classified maybe as A++ or whatever. As a single person, you have a choice as to what you buy. And I would urge you to look at the um, 
the long-term advantages of buying something that's more energy efficient, even if it's a little dearer, than the short-term uh, disadvantages of buying something that maybe uses up twice as much electricity uh, as would otherwise be the case. So you have you have a possibility of removing your packaging at the supermarket. You have a possibility of changing your own diet, which is much easier to do as a single person than as a family person, for example. Uh, you have the possibility of, of making choices, which um, are, are, are easier to make as a single person than as a, as a family unit in many respects. And, you know, make, exploit that, make mm -hmm. use of that. So we can start today doing those choices. You can start today. Uh, and, and let me tell you, I'm a hypocrite. I mean, I, I make all these novel statements, but I'm very bad at it myself. And we all are like that. We all are guilty of knowing what should be done, but not doing it ourselves. And I, I, I have to confess, I'm, I'm no model. I'm, I'm very bad. I lack the willpower to do a lot of these things, but we try. I think all we can do is try. Mm. Um, the next question is a bit different. It, um, it's like, um, can nuclear energy help offset our resilience on fossil fuels? Well, that's a very big question in Germany, isn't it? <laughs> um, climate scientists are divided on this question. There are some who believe that nuclear energy is the only way to tackle the problem that has become so urgent. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's something that many climate scientists would actually argue. Um, I'm not one of them, I have to say, because I still have concerns about the long term consequences of nuclear energy. I don't like leaving legacies that will last for hundreds, if not thousands of years in terms of nuclear waste. If we could find a way of tackling the nuclear waste problem uh, and the safety issues that do arise from nuclear energy, I'd be the first to advocate that we would go that route. But you know, I think we can still achieve the sustainable future by going for a renewable energy of wind, uh, of wave, of solar, uh, and we can get around those problems. The difficulty, of course, with wind and with solar energy is the, the question of backup and the question of what do you do when the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine. And that's been a, a problem that is slowly being eradicated. It's slowly being solved now by better battery technology, uh, by better uh, interconnections between places across Europe, where if it's calm in one place, you can be pretty sure it's very windy somewhere else. And those kinds of solutions, I think, at this stage, mean that we can get by without resorting to nuclear power. Um, uh, I think we have to get rid of coal, we have to get rid of lignite, and Germany, of course, is, is going through this big debate at the moment about that, I'm aware, but personally, I think we can do these transitions. If we plan properly, we can do them without what I think is a rather risky um, operation, nuclear power. Yeah, um, Professor um, Voigt, uh, who was here last week, her opinion was that like Professor Foyt, who was like here last week as a lecturer, her opinion was on the topic of nuclear power, that it may be as helpful for a transition period um, as well. So I think that was the case, like the case for the question. Um, so it, in your opinion, it, um, it might be as well possible to use just uh, renewable energy for that. Yeah, I mean, the reality of a transition period is we haven't got the luxury of time. If you were to start planning a new nuclear power station today from scratch, it would take you 15 years to get it going. Um, we've seen that, for example, in the UK, where they've, they were, they've been planning nuclear power stations for years, haven't got them actually, the new ones up and running yet. We've seen in Helsinki, uh, long delays over nuclear power. And also we've seen the cost of, of both the construction and the final electricity that's generated by them uh, go very high. So, you know, I, 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 I feel that we, you know, the transition period we have, as I mentioned, is, is, a, is a decade at the most. 
that if we don't solve this problem before the end of this decade, then we won't solve the problem. Um, uh, we're at a crunch now where time is of the essence and we will pass those tipping points uh, within the next 10 years if we don't actually aggressively tackle the problem. And I don't think we have the luxury of time to develop nuclear again. If there was an easy way out, if there was uh, small nuclear reactors that were safe, did not produce any nuclear waste, could be up and running in five years, yes. But I just don't see that happening at the moment technologically. It's rather like the nuclear fu fusion um, dream that we all have, that um, endless energy will be produced by nuclear fusion. We've had that dream for a long time now and hasn't materialized. Um, so um, I think we, we have to go the route that we know will work. Another question. Um, do you think that more focus should be put on strict regulations of multinational companies and large scale corporations who are more responsible for it first place? Instead of governments that have to deal with many other things, especially in developing countries and politically changed ones. Well, I think we have quite a lot of regulation of, of multinational companies at the moment in terms of their emissions. They are subject to uh, integrated pollution licenses, for example. They are subject to the European trading system, the emissions trading system as well. So they, they are in effect um, regulated, but I would agree completely that they haven't actually responded to their customers' needs as well as they should. There's a lot of greenwashing goes on. There's a lot of aspirational um, climate action goes on. And yes, I think they could do an awful lot more in terms of, uh, in terms of pulling their weight in the community. Um, but having said that, it's up to governments to regulate. It's up to governments to put the legislation down, which forces the um, forces multinational companies and industry uh, to, to do certain things. And one of, the, um, one of the things that the EU is now in the throes of contemplating uh, is what's called border adjustments. Uh, and that means that if a country is producing cement or steel um, in a very inefficient way with lots of emissions, and then importing that into the European Union, um, and competing with companies within the EU who are bound by much more strict legislation, um, then they should be forced to pay tax on entry, a border adjustment tax on entry. And I, I very much agree with that. Um, we, we've had a problem here in Ireland, for example, of companies who um, are stopped from becoming intensive milk producers in their own country. Uh, wanting to come to mop up uh, and intensify agriculture here. Um, and and we, we're trying to fight against that kind of pollution dumping. So I think companies should be responsible. But at the same time, it's for governments to legislate. It's for governments to set the rules. It's for governments to establish where companies are and are not being regulated properly. And um, I would, I would think they're not being regulated properly to the extent they should in many instances. But I, I think the ultimate responsibility is for us as voters who elect those governments to say, we want you to do more. And that's, that's where I think the decision, the trade-off between economics and environment is made. It's made by governments to decide how much do I value economic growth versus environmental purity or environmental quality. Um, I, I think we've tipped the balance in the past too far in terms of economic growth. And I think we're now realizing, especially in the last year, that environmental quality is something that's perhaps more valued by people than uh, simply material growth uh, ad nauseum. I've been working with some German colleagues on what we call well-being indices. And uh, it's been very striking that in Germany, um, when the economic crisis came about 10 years ago, uh, well-being continued to fall 
uh, as the economic recovery continued to take place. So people began to feel that although they had more money in their pocket, they didn't feel as happy or as contented as they were before. And that's an interesting discovery that, you know, the GDP is not everything. Money is not everything in terms of profits for companies. And I think people are increasingly conscious of other things that matter to them, uh, apart from simply uh, the, the extent of their pay packets. Um, the next question is, um, what happens with laws created by the same organizations that are causing the problematic? How, are we, how or where can we get the real information to decide as public what is sustainable? Well, I'm not sure about the question in particular there. Um, when you say the same organizations, I, I'm not sure whether you mean public or private or, or governmental organizations, but I would, I, would, I would interpret your question as saying what happens when governments don't do what they should be doing in terms of solving the problem and how can you get the, the real data. Um, it's hard getting data out of certain bodies. Um, it's very difficult and there is, uh, I know I've used it myself, a thing called Access to Environmental Information Directive uh, from the EU, which gives citizens a, an entitlement to ask questions uh, of government as to where such information is and what it consists of. But I think I, I can't answer your question properly because I'm not sure precisely what you mean but if it's if it's that you mean that governments are not doing what they should be doing then of course you throw the government out at the next election that's the short answer um, it's difficult I know in some cases and maybe everybody wouldn't agree with your interpretation of what's going wrong but uh, ultimately we have to put our faith in democracy and we have to be able to say uh, well you're not doing what you were elected to do, so please go. Um, I don't think private sector organizations necessarily make the rules themselves, but I do agree with the question that they are very influential on government. And you know, there's a huge uh, and very difficult um, operation of lobbying going on across Europe, especially in Brussels, but across every European capital governments are constantly coming under pressure from powerful vested interest groups. And those pressures um, are, are reflected sometimes in uh, less stringent regulation in terms of environmental quality. Uh, they're reflected in changes in subtle things like classification of what's sustainable and what's not sustainable. We're seeing this at the moment, incidentally, with a, an EU regulation called the taxonomy regulation and here this is an attempt to say well here's gas there's some biogas in it when is it sustainable and when is it not what's the mix that makes it sustainable or not sustainable and you would and i would have maybe a very different interpretation of that but you can be quite sure that gas companies are, are very active in saying well maybe <laughs> we'll push the limit up a bit. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll change the rules to suit ourselves. And the same thing is happening with forestry. When is forestry um, supposed to be sequestering and how much is it sequestering? These are the kind of rules that governments come under pressure uh, from powerful interest groups. And here, I think we have to recognize that as individuals, we have, it's a David and Goliath situation. Um, civil society is very important uh, to be strong and as strong as possible because we haven't got the financial resources, we haven't got the personnel resources to compete with some very powerful vested interest groups that may well decide to shape our future in a way we don't want. And for that, I would urge you to, to really be active in civil society, um, because I've I've found I've, I started life as a scientist, and I was I thought science informs policy, and really it doesn't. 
what informs policy uh, is who shouts loudest and who can exert the most influence. So I think I would urge you to be active uh, in, in your civil society groups on issues that you feel strongly about, because unless politicians hear your voice, then they'll listen to the voices that they hear loudest, which may not be the best ones in these instances. And maybe now the last question. Um, a lot of critics claim that technology will solve the problem of climate change in the future. Do you think that is a realistic scenario? Well, technology solved our problem with COVID-19. And let's be honest there, um, they've done wonderful things. Um, they've, they've produced uh, a breakthrough in inoculations, which uh, nobody thought possible. When it comes to the climate change issue, um, there is this possibility of the technological fix constantly dangling in front of us that, uh, you know, let's not worry about today, tomorrow we'll have the technology to solve it. I'm not as optimistic about that. And in particular, we hear an awful lot about carbon capture and storage. And in fact, if you look at some of our assumptions for the period around 2050, we're assuming that we have the technology developed for uh, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere on a big scale. And quite honestly, we haven't got anywhere near that in terms of the developments thus far. We don't have a working model um, at any scale of how we can remove carbon dioxide economically from the atmosphere. So I'm a bit wary about what we call the technological fix, the assumption that something down the road will solve our problems. And as I said already, we don't have the time to wait for that to re be realized or, or not. We have only a decade or two at the most. And therefore I think we have to change our way of working, our lifestyle uh, in the short term, because if we, rely on a technology that doesn't exist and is not proven, then we run the risk of really bad things happening in the future down the road. So I think, you know, the precautionary principle, as it's called, is what we should use here. Let's not do anything that damages our options for the future. Let's make the changes necessary now uh, that we can cope with what is thrown at us in the future. And let's not take the chance that the people that come after us will have no options, but to face a damaged world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the last question. Thank you very much for your detailed answers. And I'm sorry for all the questions I didn't have the chance to ask. Um, thank you very much for your lecture. It was very interesting. Um, and I will share my screen right now for some more detailed information. Um, can you see 